Pentagon budget escalated to $750 billion a year for two years with little or no opposition in Congress. But as Bill Hartung and others will tell you, uh, but the true cost is more like $1.2 trillion more for endless war machine. Our friends at the Poor People's Campaign and the Sunrise Movement that are here to speak to us today <clears throat> are here because we know we can't address issues of poverty, racism, and climate change if we don't change our military mindset and resource allocation. The issues are ultimately intertwined. Just as all members of the United Nations of the United Nations have agreed, yes, even the United States, with the unanimous adoption of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, sustainable peace is entwined with the end of poverty, addressing climate change, tackling inequality, gender rights, clean water, educational opportunity, and the reduction of militarism. What would a peace economy look like, in theory and in practice? How can we shift the mindset, the policies, the dollars away from endless war to true, sustainable community development here and everywhere? It's possible. It starts today. We owe it to those who follow us, the children, the grandchildren, and those that might follow them. I thank each of you for being here today to better understand how together we might build that community of peace and justice that we all might share. In 2002, the world community accepted the Earth Charter. Its preamble is as accurate today as it was then. We stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. As the world becomes increasingly interdependent and fragile, the future at once holds great peril and great promise. To move forward, we must recognize that in the midst of a magnificent diversity of cultures and life forms, we are one human family and one Earth community with a common destiny. We must join together to bring forth a sustainable global society founded on respect for nature, universal human rights, economic justice, and the culture of peace. Towards this end, it is imperative that we, the peoples of the Earth, declare our responsibility to one another to the greater community of life and to future generations. So let's get started. Joanna Macy has adopted the Iroquois tradition of beginning a community meeting with a brief exercise. Allow me to share it with you. Uh, we all enter this room this morning with our own experiences, concerns, pressing obligations, and hopeful aspirations. Let's respect that for each of us. So this is what the Iroquois uh, would do before a meeting, especially meetings that would involve some sort of treaties, because the Iroquois were, was a collection of, 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 of nations. Uh, and you can use the, the gestures in your mind, mentally or physically. We offer salutations and respect to all present at this meeting and to all who are affected by it. We brush off the chairs we sit on to make clear a space for the meeting of minds. We brush the clothing off our clothing, any debris we picked up along the way to clear our minds of extraneous matters. We wipe the tears from our eyes to acknowledge and forgive the hurt we may have received. We take the lump out of our throats to let go of the sadness or disappointment. We take the tightness out of our chest to let go of any fear or resentment. We acknowledge and pray for guidance to the great creator spirit of all life. Ho, oh, so be it. As I started to look more deeply into the possibilities of economic conversion of military spending, some names kept arising frequently. Seymour Melman, Gordon Adams, and Lloyd Jeff DeMoss were all early and frequent actors in this narrow field. I dip my toes in some of their writings. Perhaps most resonating for me was a copy of Jeff's The Peacekeeping Economy, using economic relationships to build a more peaceful, prosperous, and secure world. You can buy this book up and everybody reads. <laughs> this seemed like the perfect approach to set the stage for offering a real, realistic uh, approach to build a peace economy. 
The fact that he used the word bill in his title felt particularly right. Jeff is a professor of public policy and political economy at the University of Dallas in Texas. He has a PhD in economics from Columbia University. He's the author of numerous books, reports, articles on this topic. He has testified before Congress on multiple occasions and has been immersed in this subject area I was, when I kept going back and looking at this, for more than 40 years. In the hard-nosed realities of this world, political security is primarily a matter of relationships, not military power. <coughs> That's easy enough to demonstrate. During the whole of the Cold War, the American military spent a great deal of effort and trillions of dollars building weapons and structuring forces to deter the Soviet Union from attacking the U.S. with nuclear weapons. During much of that time, both France and Britain had enough nuclear capability to deliver a devastating, perhaps terminal, attack against the U.S. But we spent little time or resources worrying about deterring a French or British attack. The reason for the difference is clear. The U.S.-Soviet relationship was hostile, while the U.S. relationship with Britain and France was friendly. And when the Cold War finally ended, and the relationship between Russia and the U.S. became much more cordial, very few Americans in or out of the military continued to worry much about a Russian nuclear strike. Yet the Russian military remained every bit as capable of destroying the U.S. as it had been during the Cold War. It still is, and now in the last years that the U.S.-Russian relationship has been getting less friendly again, we are once again beginning to get worried. Furthermore, the U.S. has never been all that concerned about the nuclear arsenal of Israel, a nation with which we have close ties, but went to war with Iraq in 2003, citing what turned out to be mistaken fears that a hostile Iraqi government was trying to develop weapons of mass destruction. And today the U.S. is still very worried about the possibility that a hostile Iran may be trying to build a nuclear arsenal. It certainly is true that security is primarily a matter of relationships. As in the Korean Peninsula, a military standoff can give the appearance of peace but there is always an undercurrent of insecurity as long as the underlying relationship is hostile. Security cannot be complete until there is peace. And peace is more than the absence of war. It's also the absence of imminent threat of deadly violence and war. Many specialists in international relations tend to think of force or the threat of force as the most effective way to provide security because they believe it's ultimately the most effective way of influencing behavior. But economists think of influencing behavior primarily through incentives. Assuming that people have goals they're trying to achieve, they will voluntarily modify their behavior when incentives change. They don't have to be threatened or coerced. There's no particular reason why this basic approach cannot be applied to influencing the behavior of nations. The problem is to define a set of conditions that will generate stronger, positive incentives for nations to keep the peace, and then to work out a set of policies and institutions capable of creating those conditions. That task is at the core of the book, The Peacekeeping Economy, that Terry mentioned a moment ago. That approach should help make possible a shift away from relying mainly on the threat or use of military force toward much less expensive and far more effective means of achieving peace and security through economic relationships. It's not bullets and bombs alone that kill and maim people. There's also such a thing as structural violence. Violence that is built into the structure of political, social, and economic systems. People who die of malnutrition in a world with more than enough food, who are blinded, crippled, or killed by preventable diseases, who become targets of vicious crimes committed by desperate, marginalized people that have lost their 
sense of humanity. These are not the victims of war. They are the victims of structural violence. Yet they are just as damaged, just as dead, as those we count as war casualties. If we adopt this deeper idea that positive peace includes the prevention of war and the elimination of structural violence, it's more obvious that economics has a powerful and critical role to play in making and keeping the peace. There are a few basic principles that define the character of peacekeeping economic relationships. The first and by far the most important of these is that relationships must be balanced and mutually beneficial. So that's principle one, establish balanced relationships. Economic activity can make war more likely or less likely, which it does depends crucially on the nature of the relationship, not just the extent of the activity. Unbalanced exploitative relationships tend to increase the number and severity of conflicts. Balanced, mutually beneficial relationships tend to reduce them. A relationship is balanced and mutually beneficial if its benefits flow to every participant and there's a rough equality between everyone's contribution to the relationship and the benefits they get. Unbalanced exploitative relationships are those in which the flow of benefit is overwhelmingly in one direction and does not correspond to relative contribution. There's some interesting evidence from the field of experimental economics that people intuitively understand the importance of treating others fairly in economic transactions. There's something called the ultimatum game by game theorists. It's a one-time, two-person game in which one person, the experimenter, provides a sum of money, say $100, and one person, the proposer, makes an offer to divide it with another person, the responder, in a specified proportion. So the proposer can say, I'll keep 90%, you get 10%. Or the proposer can say, let's do 50-50. They can say anything they want. But the key is, if the offer is accepted, they split the money as agreed. If the offer is not accepted by the responder, neither of them gets anything. After running this experiment many times in various countries, under various conditions, researchers noted that rather than trying to get a very lopsided deal, the majority of proposers offered the responders 40 to 50 percent of the sum of money. And about half the responders rejected any offer below 30 percent. You can't be sure whether most of the proposers made a balanced offer out of a belief in fairness or out of pure self-interest. Okay, they want to make sure that the bid is accepted. But unlike the predictions of economists, it's very clear that half the responders prefer to walk away empty-handed rather than accept any offer they considered really unfair. Most economists would say that's not what will happen. Because even if I'm offered one dollar to the $99 for the other person, I'm still better off than having nothing. But the reality is people don't act that way. They reject any offer that looks considerably unbalanced as being, you might say, insulting, in one way or another, unacceptable. Even if everyone is gaining something in an unbalanced relationship, the fact that the vast majority of benefit flows elsewhere is irritating to those who receive less than they contribute. There's little or no incentive for them to work at resolving whatever conflicts might occur, economic or otherwise. If they come to see disrupting the relationship as key to rebalancing it or replacing it with a better relationship, they'll be ready to raise the seriousness of those conflicts in extreme cases, even to the point of war. We don't actually have to look very far to come up with an example. The American Revolution is an example of the power of economic exploitation to provoke antagonisms that can lead to war.
Balanced economic relationships have the opposite effect. Since everyone gains benefit, at least equal to their contribution, out of pure self-interest, no one wants to see the relationship disrupted, let alone disrupted themselves. When conflicts occur, they will try hard to settle them amicably. If their partners come under external stress, they have an incentive to relieve rather than aggravate the pressure. In this situation, everyone in the relationship will feel more secure, and no one will need to expend extra effort and expense just to keep it going. Put simply, a balanced relationship is a more efficient relationship. The benefits are achieved at a lower cost. <coughs> Furthermore, dividing the gains more fairly stimulates economic growth and development of all parties to the relationship. Resources are more effectively used, producers become more productive, the size of the market grows. As a result, they have more to offer each other as time goes by, both as sources of products and as sources of profits. The advantages of balanced relationships grow over time. Beyond this, when two nations are engaged in an expanding web of balanced economic interactions, more and more people in both countries have increasing contact as a natural result of engaging in economic activity together. They need to exchange emails, talk on the telephone, even have face-to-face -face meetings simply to coordinate what they're doing. At first, these contacts may be focused strictly on the business at hand. But people are people, and eventually their social interactions will lead them to know each other better. They'll spend more time in each other's country, become more familiar with each other's life circumstances. Sometimes they won't like each other. But more often than not, this increased contact will at least melt away stereotypical images they may have had of each other and lead to a greater understanding and empathy. But even when gains are balanced, if the process involved in making key decisions is unbalanced, those with less input and control are likely to feel too dependent on the goodwill of others. Believing that the terms of the relationship are subject to arbitrary, unilateral change creates insecurity and weakens commitment. When decision power is more equally shared, Everyone involved in the, in the relationship has ownership in it. It's their property. It's not simply a gift someone has given them and can just as easily withdraw. Every participant will therefore be motivated to take care of the relationship to ensure its continuation and success. This cannot help but strengthen the incentives of all participants to find peaceful ways of settling their conflicts with each other. When decision power is balanced, all participants know they will be directly involved in any decision to change the rules or the character of the relationship. This will not necessarily prevent all changes that reduce their gains or increase their costs, but it will assure them no, no changes will occur without their input and consent. And it's easier for anyone who's been a full partner in deciding to make a change to accept it without undue hostility, even if it hurts. Painful change that is coerced or imposed is an entirely different thing. Let's go back for a moment again to the American Revolution. The slogan, one of the most popular slogans of the American Revolution, was not no taxation. What was it? No taxation without representation. No taxation without representation. We weren't protesting being taxed. We were protesting not having anything to say about it. We didn't have any decision power. And that also built up the antagonisms between the countries. So there are two aspects of balance in international economic relationships that are key. The balance of benefits and the balance of decision power. Balance of benefits is more important to the power of international economic relationships to keep the peace. But balance of decision power is also important, since it's what makes participants in these relationships 
see themselves as partners rather than subordinates. When economic relationships are balanced in both these senses, current gains and the prospect of greater future gains create strong incentive to settle the conflicts that inevitably arise more peacefully. And as those conflicts are dealt with successfully time after time, the thought of threatening to go to war against valued economic partners slowly recedes. And war itself ultimately comes to be seen as inherently counterproductive. I want to use a particularly good real world example of this. It's become a little more tricky in recent times. And that's the European Union. Thank you. The power and practicality of mutually beneficial, balanced economic relationships in keeping the peace is illustrated by the development and growth of the international organization that became today's EU. The European Union began as the European Coal and Steel Community, formed by six nations shortly after World War II, with a deliberate purpose of trying to build economic bonds to make the outbreak of war among them less likely. By the middle of the 1980s, the dozen nations that belonged to its successor organization, the European Economic Community, included Belgium, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, and Spain. Now think about these nations. They fought countless wars with each other over the centuries, including World Wars I and II. They were also the major colonial powers that militarily dominated and exploited much of the rest of the world. Yet today, even today, if you were to ask any of the leaders of these countries, the odds of them actually going to war against another member of the EU, they wouldn't even consider it a sensible question. These countries still have many conflicts with each other, that's very obvious, economic and otherwise. Some of them are very serious. They were deeply conflicted over how to deal with the financial crisis in the EU country that used the euros as their common currency. Even more striking, in 2016, in the national refer referendum, when the people of Great Britain voted to leave the EU, and as in Britain, there have been growing political support for secession in France, Netherlands, and a number of other EU countries, mainly what to do over disagreements concerning the flood of refugees that came in from the Middle East and North Africa over the EU's borders. But even in Britain, the largest part of the public seems to be in favor of a soft Brexit rather than a radical departure from the EU. They are hoping to negotiate an agreement in which the intricate web of free market and other economic relationships within the EU remain intact, but Britain regains greater political control over its migration and related policy. They don't want to see the EU shatter. The EU nations may split on the degree and kind of closer political integration they support, but they understand that the network of balanced, mutually beneficial economic relationships they have created has given all of them a strong stake in finding ways to manage, if not resolve, the conflicts they have with each other. For more than 65 years now, they have benefited enormously from greater economic integration, and the more peaceful atmosphere it has created strong incentives to maintain. They simply have too much to lose to let their agreements get out of control. So they debate, they argue, they scream at each other, but they still don't threaten or think about threatening each other militarily, let alone actually going to war. Using properly structured economic relationships to build and keep the peace even between former enemies is an eminently practical and achievable enterprise. And by the way, one of the other very good examples in this world is the relationship between the US and Canada, it's sort of close by. Where we are today. Because many Americans think of Canada almost being a part of the United States. Which sure. I understand many of the Canadians find irritating. <laughs> but in any case, um, 
there is a very close relationship between the countries and has been for a long time. We still don't agree on everything, of course. But in the 19th century, in the 18th century, when the Revolutionary War occurred, they were the bad guys. They were on the wrong side. Yeah. They were supporting the British. So there was very, very great hostility between Canada and what was forming as the U.S. And in fact, in the mid-19th century, there was a naval arms race on the Great Lakes between the U.S. and Canada. Mm. But look at the relationship we've had for so many years now. It's based on economic integration. It's based on a series of uh, actions in which we treated each other more or less equally. I understand that perfectly. But still, it's an example that you can turn hostile neighbors or hostile other parties more toward being less likely to engage in physical hostilities, military hostilities, by building the right kinds of economic relationships between them. Principle two, that won't take as long. <laughs> Emphasize development. The poverty and frustration of so many of the world's people is a fertile breeding ground for violent conflict. There have been well more than 150 wars since the end of World War II, and they've taken about 20 million lives. Nearly all of them have been fought in developing countries. People in desperate economic straits tend to reach for extreme solutions. Now, there are many reasons why war erupts. And therefore, few grounds for believing that by itself, even a great improvement in everyone's material well-being would put an end to war. But in encouraging inclusive and widespread development is important to giving the largest possible part of the world's population a direct, obvious, and personal stake in avoiding disruptive explosions of violent conflict. Economic and political development helps keep the peace by strengthening resistance to the outbreak of war, as well as reducing one source of strain that can directly or indirectly lead to war, the frustration and hostility of those who are economically deprived and marginally, politically marginalized. Emphasizing development is not only important to inhibiting both interstate and intrastate war, it's also a useful counter-terrorist strategy despite the fact that many terrorists are neither poverty-stricken nor uneducated. All but the craziest, most isolated terrorists depend on support, at least for their cause, if not for their tactics. They have to be able to recruit operatives, move around, coordinate activities, find secure places to train. This is much, much easier to do the wider their base of support. To recruit reliable operatives and build support networks, terrorist groups must also have a cause that can convince more or less normal people to engage in or support horrible acts of violence they would not otherwise condone. Most, if not all, of these causes involve calls to the service of a disadvantaged group or to a force greater than the individuals being recruited or solicited for support. If people can be made to feel that by engaging in or supporting terrorism, they become the avengers of a great wrong done to those they consider to be their people, they can be made not only ready, but eager to carry out and support horrific acts of violence against innocent people. But development can be an effective counter-terrorist approach because raising the economic well-being and the political status of the group that terrorists and their supporters feel part of makes it harder for them to recruit and weaken support. Development can help dry up both the pool of potential terrorists and the wider support for terrorist groups that is vital to their operation. The best way to deal with terrorism in the short run is not development. It's rather first-rate intelligence and police work. But in the long run, Progress in generating sustained improvement in the material and political conditions of life for the vast majority of people in the developing countries 
helps undermine terrorism and strengthen incentives to avoid war, while also reducing structural violence and therefore building positive peace. Principle number three, minimize ecological stress. There's no question that competition for depletable resources generates conflict. The desire to control access to raw materials and fuels was one of the driving forces behind the force-based colonization of much of the world by the economically and militarily advanced nations in centuries past. This competition continues to bring nations and groups within nations into conflicts of the most dangerous kind those in which at least one party believes that the continued economic well-being, political so sovereignty, or even survival of its people is at stake. For example, there's little argument that Middle East conflicts would be much less likely to lead to action by major military powers if it were not for oil. Furthermore, the air and the water don't recognize these artificial lines that we've painted on the earth to separate ourselves from each other. Pollution that crosses borders may not lead to war by itself, but it has already generated considerable conflict and could generate much more. There is widespread international hostility to the failure of the major greenhouse gas polluters to take seriously the effect it's likely to have on climate change imposing potentially enormous long-run costs on the world economy. Every additional source of tension contributes to the strain on the international system and therefore to the likelihood that other sources of conflict will lead to the eruption of violence. Some have argued that the expansion of economic activity itself is inconsistent with maintaining environmental quality. That modern production techniques and consumption activities generate an unavoidable degree of ecological stress. While there's some truth to this, the levels of economic well-being to which people in a developed country have become accustomed can be maintained, improved, and extended to the people of developing nations without even generating current levels of environmental damage. Accomplishing that feat requires, first of all, a great deal more attention to the efficient use of natural resources. Secondly, the development and extensive use of pollution-reducing technologies and procedures. And thirdly, a substantial shift toward qualitative rather than quantitative economic growth particularly on the part of the developed countries. Using natural resources more efficiently requires more intensive and widespread recycling, improving the design and operation of the energy using systems, and greater reliance on ecologically benign renewable energy and material resources. Recycling materials dramatically reduces resource depletion, transforms solid waste into useful material, and saves energy. More than 40 years ago, it's shocking to me to remember it was that long, I wrote my first book. It was called The Conservation Response. And I estimated in that book that improved design and operation of energy using systems with existing technologies of that era could have reduced energy consumption in the US by 30 to 50% without reducing living standards. The further development of renewable resources will provide supplies of energy and materials that can sustain economic activity indefinitely. The development and use of improved pollution control technologies and procedures leads better filtration, waste treatment, and other after-the-fact cleanup. But it also means the development and use of less environmentally damaging production and consumption technologies. Finally, continuing to think of economic growth mainly in quantitative terms, which many of my colleagues in economics seem fixed on doing, is unrealistic, even foolish, and unnecessary. Standards of living are also improved by improvements in the quality of goods and services. 
shifting attention to qualitative improvement will allow the developed nations to curb their appetite for non-renewable resources, helping to make their continued growth indefinitely sustainable. It will also reduce environmental pollution, create space for the quantitative expansion of goods and services still required in some developing nations. Maximizing energy efficiency, developing renewable ecologically benign energy and material resources, and recycling will not only improve the quality of the environment, but also reduce international conflict and strain on our ability to, keep, to make peace. Let me just take a few more moments to discuss with you how we could make this happen. My book, The Peacekeeping Economy, not only lays out these core principles, but also some practical approaches toward building this system in the real world. These include actions that can be taken by business, government, and ordinary citizens, as well as ways of modifying international institutions, such as the UN, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, to better support this new security system. There's also a discussion on how to smoothly handle the transition from our present security system to one based mainly on economic peacekeeping. We don't have enough time to talk about all of this, but I want to emphasize, at least to illustrate, why ordinary consumers can do powerful things to help establish peacekeeping principles. During the 1990s, a number of organizations called for a consumer boycott of Nike, the international sports shoe company, charging that the company and its subcontractors were operating sweatshops where very low-paid workers, including children, were working in unsafe and unhealthy conditions. After years of battling the boycotters, in 1998, the company's CEO publicly announced that they would no longer operate sweatshops nor tolerate such practice among their suppliers. By the way, you've got to watch these guys. Even after they make such a pledge, they have to be monitored and the pressure has to continue to be applied to see that they keep that pledge going. There are many other examples. A decade of protest against environmentally questionable practices caused Home Depot, the world's largest buyer of construction material, to change its practices, not perfectly, but change them in the right direction. Even Walmart made a commitment to reduce energy use in its stores, improve the efficiency of its trucks, and minimize packaging. In addition to consumer boycotts, some have suggested using consumer boycotts, organized campaign to preferentially buy goods from companies that are doing things right. In any case, organized consumer actions can put enormous pressure on firms to behave in ways that are more consistent with peacekeeping economic processes. And they do not have to have a huge impact on the company's sales to be effective. If you can affect the sales, or even the sales growth rate, by a few percent, it will certainly be taken seriously by the firm and by its competitors. Let me conclude now. If we insist on continuing to think about security, primarily in narrow military-oriented terms, we will be stuck with the enormous expense of equipping and maintaining very large military forces that in recent years have proven remarkably ineffective, if not counterproductive, in furthering our national interests, and thus our national political and economic security. We will miss the chance to realize the enormous security gains that could be achieved at much lower cost by relying mainly on economic peacekeeping. We simply cannot allow ourselves to be trapped by an unwillingness to think broadly and act boldly. Economic peacekeeping cannot be guaranteed to work all the time. But then no security strategy works all the time. Certainly those that depend on the primary threat of force, military force, to keep the peace have, repelled, have failed repeatedly, as is made clear by the long history of armed confrontation that is sooner or later erupted into war. But in the daily operation of the European Union, 
we still see evidence that peacekeeping economically is a practical and effective strategy for building security and keeping the peace. We can create a web of international economic relationships that not only serves our material needs, but also provides strong positive incentives to make and keep the peace. And rather than a world of deepening inequality and growing insecurity, we can build a world that is once at once more equitable, peaceful, prosperous, and secure. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. So uh, just uh, I'd ask Lloyd, uh, Jeff, to uh, repeat the question in case people in the back don't hear it. But uh, stand up. Let me just ask a very crude question. I appreciate your talk very much and agree with the idea that there's a material basis to building peace. But isn't this an argument against capitalism? I mean, in other words, how far do you have to go to create a network of mutually responsive relationships in economic terms uh, when, say, for example, with the EU, it's, it was built into a global capitalist system where there was ongoing destruction of the environment and harm to the underdeveloped world, as well as growing inequality within the EU nations. So I'm wondering if the notion of qualitative growth is really compatible with capitalism, which seems to be inherently connected to quantitative growth in terms of ex expansion of in money terms. Yeah, I don't think this is an argument in any sense against capitalism. Uh, after all, I'm not talking about eliminating markets. I'm not talking about eliminating private ownership. What I'm saying is that we have to be, we have to take into account in the relationships that we form, the fact that these relationships have an impact on national security, whether we think about it or not. And if we do take it into account, we can find ways of making those relationships more balanced. I want to point out that one of the things that the EU did was balance decision power in many ways. And many decisions which involve a lot of EU nations it cannot be done without general agreement. It slows things down at times, but it's very important. They took into account the importance of feeling part of the decision-making process as well. But Walmart didn't become an uncapitalist firm, nor did Home Depot, nor any of the others I mentioned, when they took to a more sensible form of operating their business. There's still room for making profits. I don't look at capitalism as an evil system. In fact, I've just written in another book, which is coming out in the uh, middle of November, Building the Good Society. How could I forget that? The subtitle The Power and Limits of Markets, Democracy, and Freedom. And I talk about some of these issues you've raised more directly. Um, there, we celebrated, many people celebrated as the triumph of capitalism, the collapse of the Soviet Union and other, some other central planned countries that decided to switch their economic systems. But if you look at both systems, directly and without bias, what you see is each system had its strong points and its weak points. It turned out that things that are the strong points for capitalism and the weak points for central planning, like continued expansion, rate, raising standards of living. And clearly, the centrally planned countries did not do as well in raising, in raising the standard of living as did the capitalist countries. So I'm looking for what we can learn from both of those sides. And that's what that book is about. It's completely compatible with what I just said, but it talks about it in, from a different angle. It's talking about international economic political relationships, how to maximize freedom, not how to destroy capitalism. Which means to maximize your happiness or satisfaction. 
how they translated that into buying as much stuff as you could get your hands on. It's right. <laughs> something of a mystery to me. Because if you think about it in their terms, that there is something called utility, which measures generally the enjoyment we get from our lives, the pleasure we accumulate. It has lots of dimensions to it. It has the dimension of relationships with other people. It has a dimension of equality or inequality, freedom or lack of freedom. There's a million other things to it. And only very recently have economists come to talk about happiness as being the legitimate or a legitimate goal of an economic system. But in fact, it is. There are lots of pieces to this. And, uh, and I don't think it's necessary to just look at it in consumerist terms. That doesn't make sense to me. It's also a recipe for ecological disaster. There is no question that the military is totally grown beyond any rational point. Military spending is astronomical, as other, other speakers will detail, I'm sure, more detail than I, than I will. We need to move that establishment. We need, to, we need to reduce the size of the military industrial complex. And one of the things that I think we need to do in order to accomplish that is to pay attention to this issue of conversion that Terry mentioned in his early remarks. The problem is now, when you say, cut the military budget, there are a whole lot of people in a whole lot of communities who here take my job away, reduce the income of our, of our city, throw us into a downward economic spiral. We can get around that because there are a solid set of arguments and studies that have been done for many years on this issue of economic conversion, which is precisely the question of how do you take people who are working in the military sector and move them to stop making weapons and start doing something that's socially and economically and so on useful, not damaging to our country. When you can change the question or well, you can change the trade-off that they see to instead of this job making weapons or I'm out of work, to this job making weapons or this other job doing something else that uses my skills and doesn't result in weapons, maybe even results in a product I'm proud to say I help produce. I think that's a key part of what we need to do to take apart the military industrial.